I kind of just wish that was like my theme song as I, whenever I walked into a room, just na 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 just come on in. Anyways, that's, that's for free this morning. Good morning. Hope you're having a good Sunday. It's good to see you. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm also glad that you be here. Go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, which will be where we'll be spending uh, all of our time this morning as we're in the second week of our series through a good portion of the book of Genesis. This is our uh, spring series, if you call it, started last week, and this will take us through, for the most part, the the majority of the summer as well. So we'll be kind of camping out in Genesis for the next several, several uh, weeks uh, together. Uh, the first chapter of Genesis is one of the most God-centered chapters in the entire Bible. God is mentioned by name 32 times in 31 verses. And you add in personal pronouns uh, used, God is mentioned no less than 43 times in Genesis 1 alone. That's on the very first page of Scripture, the very first chapter of Scripture. The Holy Spirit ushers us into the presence of God and keeps us there for the rest of the book. No wonder Satan hates this chapter. No wonder why he's brought his heavy artillery, if you will, up against this chapter to discredit it and so doubt about Genesis 1 in the hearts and lives of men and women. If we abandon Genesis 1 as unfactual or unreliable, as mere mythology or as a doctored up version of the Babylonian creation epic, if we totally deem it as unacceptable to modern science, then Satan has won. Let me ask you this, friends. If the Holy Spirit cannot be trusted when he tells us of creation? How can he be trusted when he tells us of salvation? If if what he says about earth in Genesis 1 can be questioned, then then what he says about heaven in Revelation 22 can be questioned. If the Holy Spirit cannot be trusted in Genesis 1, how can he be trusted in John 3.16? There are many theories when it comes to Genesis chapter 1 and that have to do with the breakdown of time, the breakdown of the days, a lot of theories, a lot of opinions, and I just wanted to share a few of those uh, quickly, uh, and then we'll move on. One of the theories about Genesis 1 is called a day-age theory. Look to your neighbor and say day-age theory. Day-age theory. Get used to that. We're going to be doing a lot of the look-to-your-neighbor stuff this morning just to keep us awake, all right? So just get used to that. Maybe maybe introduce yourself to your neighbor afterwards if you don't know that neighbor, okay? Uh, but day-age theory, it means it says the days, the days of Genesis 1 are viewed not as literal 24-hour days, but as ages or vast periods of time. Elaborate charts have been drawn up to Reconcile Genesis 1 with geology. Another theory is the gap theory. The gap theory. Genesis 1 records the original account of creation, and between the first and second verses of Genesis, theorists postulate a gap of countless ages occurred, and in that gap, they insert all the ages demanded by geologists, ending with the glacial age said to be described in Genesis 1, verse 2. Personally, I hold the literal 24-hour creation view. We're, 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 we're definitely put in the terms of, of, of day, and the Hebrew word for day, as we see in Genesis 1, and throughout the Hebrew of the Old Testament is the Hebrew word yom. Look to your neighbor and say yom. That's Y-O-M, yom. That's a little tidbit for later this week. Maybe you want to show how smart you are and be like, hey, you want to go on yom day or whatever? I mean, I don't know why, however you want to uh, uh, say that, but it's the word yom, and it literally means, for the most part, a regular 24-hour day. And I think there are a lot of good reasons to take yom here in Genesis 1 as referring to a normal 24-hour day. I just have two quick reasons, and I'll share those. Reason number one, the mentioning of morning and evening throughout the entire chapter. We're definitely put into the realm of darkness and light of cycles and not long cycles, kind of kind of quick cycles. This suggests that we're talking about a normal day. It has darkness, it has light, morning and evening, a kind of a normal day feel. The second reason is this whenever you have in the Old Testament numbered days, they always, always refer to a regular 
24-hour day. And so that's the first day, that's the second day, that's the third day. It's not a metaphorical phrase like a day as in a thousand years type of statement, but rather it's a normal day. And so the first chapter of Genesis is remarkable as a statement of fact, however it's viewed. And Pastor Todd and I, we've chatted about this. We want to give uh, space for these, what we would call secondary issues here within our church and here especially within Genesis chapter one. What are secondary issues? Secondary issues would be things like, how do you view Genesis one? Is it a a day age theory, is it the gap theory, a little 24 hour view? Those are secondary issues. Another example of a secondary issue would be how you view the end times, pre trib, mid trib, post trib. Maybe you don't even know what trib you are, but that's okay. I mean, you can hold all these different views about these things, and we can still have Christian fellowship. We can still be church members together. We can still be friends. We can still have uh, unity and serve together and do these things. And uh, have our own opinions all backed up with different passages in Scripture and our opinions about uh, uh, of different things in the Bible and almost hold the, hold the attitude and thought of, hey, you know, I, I think this, you might think this, that's okay, we'll find out when we get to heaven type of deal. You know what I mean? Then there's the primary issues. Primary issues are more important than secondary issues. Secondary issues, we are, excuse me, primary issues, we have to agree on those things to be church members together, to have Christian fellowship with, with each other, to, to serve together, to, to agree on these things. An example of primary issues would be the virgin birth of Christ. You, you kind of just have to fall. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, we got to land in the same area as that. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The, the inerrancy of Scripture, just to give a few examples. Kind of the, the big deal stuff, right? You gotta, you gotta, we got to land, land at the same point with these primary issues. And so, how do you view Genesis 1 as it refers to time and days? This would be a secondary issue. And we just wanted to give space for those things, uh, especially today and then moving forward. Moses did not write Genesis 1 according to theories of creation that were current in the schools of his day, even though the Bible says he was learned in all the ways of the Egyptians. I mean, Moses essentially grew up as an Egyptian prince, and so he had the, one of the, some of the greatest education in the known world at the time. Egyptian myths said that there was a primeval ocean upon which appeared an egg, and from that egg was born the sun god, and the sun god had Four children, they were Geb, Shu, Tednut, and Nut. And from the rivalries of those God children, from the sun God, the creation of the world takes place. I thank God that Genesis chapter 1 does not start off like that. Can I get an amen this morning? You with me? Okay, good. Instead, we have a narrative that rises like the Himalayan peaks far above all other human creation epics. The Babylonian epic is a story and plot and counterplot of these banquets and rivalries and wars. The Greeks pictured a, a, a mythical giant named Atlas standing at the borders of the earth, holding up the globe on his tired head and arms. The Hindus thought the world rested on the backs of three elephants, which in turn stood on the back of one giant tortoise, which in turn swims around in a cosmic sea. Praise God, the Bible does not start off like that. Amen? I'm glad our God does not swim around in a cosmic sea. Peter Stoner, a mathematician, lists three, or excuse me, 12 steps of creation in Genesis 1, uh, and they are this. Light, verse 3. Darkness dispelled from the earth, verse 4. The atmosphere is established, verse 6. The seas appointed their boundaries, verse 9. The continents are raised, verse 10. Plant life formed, namely grasses, herbs, and fruit trees, verse 11. The sun, moon, and stars appointed to function, verse 14. Marine life created, verse 20. Fowls created, verse 21. The age of the monsters decreed, verse 21. The creation of land vertebrates and creeping things, verse 24. And then twelfthly, man is created, in verse 26. Now, these things are not only correctly named and listed in proper order, but also Moses' chances of writing Genesis 1 by accident would amount to one chance in 31 sextillion. Now, I went to Bible college, okay? I don't know what that number means, so I looked it up. There's a thing called Google. I don't know if you heard of it. 31 sextillion is 31 followed by 21 zeros. An astronomical number. I can't even fathom how big that is, but here's an illustration to help. That would be like having a raffle with that number of tickets. 
to print them would call for 8 million printing presses, each capable of producing 2,000 tickets a minute, running day and night without stopping for 5 million years. One of the tickets is marked. Our chance of drawing the one ticket on the first try would be the same as Moses writing Genesis 1 by accident. Because Moses did not write the facts recorded in Genesis 1 by accident, and because he had no means of writing Genesis 1 as a result of human reasoning, we must, we must have to conclude that Moses wrote Genesis 1 by divine revelation from no other than God himself. A lot, I know. It kind of came out swinging there. There was no like introductory funny story to get everyone warmed up. I get it. But, but this stuff's important, okay? So hopefully you're in your copy of God's Word, Genesis chapter 1. We're beginning in the first chapter of the Bible, the first page of recorded scripture, beginning in the third verse of the Bible. After last week, Pastor Todd uh, walked us through the first two verses of Genesis 1. I thought it was a, just a fantastic kind of introductory message to this series. And if you have not listened to that, I'd highly encourage you to do so because it is a fantastic starting point for the things we'll be talking about today and then so on. If you haven't listened to that, it's ankinyfree.org slash sermons. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, please be looking in your copy of God's Word, and you can follow along or listen along as I read out loud. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning. The first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning. The fourth day, and God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And so God created the great sea creatures, and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things of the, and the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over everything that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, 
I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus, The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Bow with me as I pray. Father, we're thankful for this time together. We're thankful for the opportunity to gather with friends and family. Lord, as we saying just a few minutes ago, Father, let your name be magnified in this place. Let your name be magnified in this message. Let your name be magnified in this room. Let your name be magnified in our lives. Let your name be magnified in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our area of community work. Father, be with us now as we look into Genesis 1 and the first three verses of Genesis 2 and help us to pay attention and look with attentive eyes and hear with attentive ears that you, for what you might have for us this morning from your word. All God's people said, amen. And before we jump into each day, I want to draw out some similarities between the days and how this week actually breaks down. The first three days have to do with creation of form and order out of formlessness. The second three days have to do with the creation of fullness and harmony to rectify the emptiness. Not only is this true, but there's a striking correspondence between days one, two, and three, and days four, five, and six. Here here are a few uh, things I found extremely interesting that talk about the order in which God created everything in Genesis chapter one. Light was created on day one, which corresponds to lights, sun, moon, and stars that were created on day four. Sea and sky that were created on day two, corresponds to fish and, 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 and birds in the seas and in the sky on day five. Fertile earth was created on day three, and that corresponds to animals and man with which God filled the earth on day six. We can see that out of the formlessness, God brought about perfect order. Out of the emptiness, he brought about abundant fullness, and God set out to create the universe in a very orderly way, not haphazardly. Another thing worth noticing is the majesty of creation by decree. God simply spoke, uttered the words, and it was done. It was there. It existed. It was full. Each act of God's, each act of God, each day begins with, and God said, spoke it into existence. How marvelous is that? Quick word of encouragement, as I did with the first hour in 8 o'clock, before we jump into our text. As we go through these points and through these days, so many of us has probably read this chapter dozens and dozens of times. Some of us grew up in Sunday school. We've, we've, we've gone through the, anybody grew up with flannel graph? Can I get an amen for, for, for flannel graph? I'm, st- I'm, still, I'm still a little old enough to have flannel graph uh, when I was in Sunday school at my home church. And man, I remember my Sunday school teacher putting up all the flannel graph stuff of the days and all that stuff. But man, let us go through this morning with childlike wonder over these things. Look with fresh eyes at the text and let us marvel at the glory and amazing work that God did in Genesis 1 together. And don't just sit back and say, ah, same old story, I've heard it before. Look with fresh eyes. That, I, I cannot encourage you enough to do that. So let's dive into our text. Number one, how life was established on earth. How life was established on earth, verses 3 to 13. There are three stages in this process of establishing life on earth. First, God dealt with the darkness in verse 3. God dealt with the darkness in verse 3. The statement, and God said, occurs 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, and it introduces God's first set of commandments, none of which have been broken. And that stands in stark contrast with God's second set of commandments, commandments, none of which have been kept apart from Jesus Christ. And the statement that dispelled the darkness is compelling. God said, literally translated, light be and light was. 
Nobody even today can tell us what light really is. We, we know what light does. It brightens the room. We have lights right here that are quite bright. We have lights coming down on y'all that, are, that, are, that let you see your Bibles, that let you see the person next to you, that let you see your surroundings so it's not dark and, and you can function and do these things. But no one really knows what light is. It's one of the most mysterious entities in the entire universe. In physics, it's become the new absolute, as such as the heart of the famous equation E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass multiplied by the speed of light squared, which in turn ushered in the atomic age. And God said, light be, in light was. In other words, God's words are not only legislative, they're also executive. Look to your neighbor and say executive. Executive. When God speaks... It is done that Jesus was indeed God manifest in the flesh is evident from his words, which with he had the same quality about them. While sleeping in a boat, for instance, Jesus is sleeping and his frightened disciples run to Jesus and say, Jesus, there's a storm around us. Save us. We, we're going to drown. The boat's going to go down any second. And so Jesus wakes up and, and he calms the storm and he says, peace, be still. And it says there was a great calm on the waters. Another example, because Jesus' words are executive, he stood before the tomb of a man named Lazarus who had been dead for four days. His body was decomposed and he cried, Lazarus, come forth! And the Bible says the man which, which who was dead came forth. Another example, a leper came to Jesus riddled with that fatal and foul disease and he said, Jesus, if it be thy, thy will, you can cleanse me. And Jesus said, be thou clean in the King James Version and he was clean. He was healed. It was the same almighty words that chaos and darkness heard in the early dawn of time when they took their flight away. Next, God dealt with the disorder. He began by raising the clouds. In terms of sheer mechanical engineering, the work of the second day of creation, to me, is flat out astounding. The, the amount of vapor continually suspended in the air above us is estimated at 54 trillion 460 billion tons. The water is 773 times the weight of air, and so that gives the idea of the sheer power required to separate the waters from the waters. The annual precipitation on the earth in form of water and snow is 800, or excuse me, 1,860 cubic miles, enough to cover the entire earth to a depth of three feet. The supply of water above the earth is maintained by evaporation. That's the constant lifting of water above the earth into the atmosphere through the power of the sun, and we take all this for granted. Next, God raised the continents. Think about how majestic that scene would be. God raising the continents. It would be difficult to find anywhere in print a more sublime or more simple statement of fact that we have in verses 9 and 10. Between verses 9 and verse 13, there are 126 words. That's right, I counted. That's been my job this week. And of those 126 words, 100 of those words are a single syllable. Only supernatural wisdom could compress such mighty deeds into simple language. Amen? Moses declared that God gathered the waters together into one place. Now, critics have come after Moses and called him a simpleton for making such a silly statement, they say. They said that Moses had probably only seen one body of water, and he, he imagined there probably was only one, they, they say, and certainly Moses had never seen the Atlantic or the Pacific, but Moses is not making an ignorant statement. We now know, although the continents are divided, the sea occupies one bed. God set to the sea its boundaries. A thousand years ago, there was a man named King Canute. Look to your neighbor and say, King Canute. It's a fun thing to say. King Canute ruled England, Denmark, and Norway, and he was so wise and able a king that his subjects actually wanted to worship him. Now, King Canute refused the adoration of his subjects, and to teach them the lesson of his own morality, he told them to carry his throne to the edge of the sea and place it just below the high tide mark where the ocean was. And there he sat, enthroned, watching the waves come in, and the waves came, and they were swirling around his feet, and they began to laugh around his lap, and the king raised up, stood on his throne, waved his scepter over the sea and said, stand back, stand back, ye waves. But the proud waves rolled on 
We know you not, O little man, they seem to say. Our limits are decreed by a greater king than you. Think about this. Twice a day, every day, since the dawn of the third day of creation, the tides of the earth have shouted the sovereignty of God. Ponder that for a moment. Isn't that breathtaking? In the deathless words of Sir Robert Grant, he says this, The earth, with its store of wonders untold, Almighty, thy power hath found it of old, hath established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it hath cast, like a mantle, the sea. Finally, God dealt with the deadness of the planet, the deadness of the planet. Grass, herb yielding, seed, and fruit trees rose up and covered the earth. The text employs three Hebrew words to describe this phase of creation. They are deshe, translated grass, eseb, translated herb, and peri, translated fruit. In the first plant, the seed is not particularly noted because it's not obvious to the eye. In the second, the seed is marked by the feature. And in the third, the characteristic mark is the fruit. And so Moses geniusly, under the inspiration of God, catalogs the earth's vegetation by a simple natural division using as his guide the structure of plants and their seeds. Isn't that amazing? How would, how would Moses know to do that? Only under God's inspiration. And so life appeared on the earth. Life. Not as a struggling fragile, lonely form as National Geographic would have you see, when in a variety with amazing design that staggers the imagination, or at least it does to me. It's estimated there are more than 100,000 species of plant life on the globe, on the globe and more than 5,000 forms of grass alone. Isn't that amazing? The basic command for all living things was that each reproduce after its kind. The expression occurs ten times in Genesis 1, and it's the rock upon which the whole theory of evolution perishes because God has decreed that there be no change from one kind to another. Now, there may be mutation from, uh, and change within a given kind, but no kind has ever changed into another kind. The principles of genetics have firmly established the fact that inherited life characteristics are implanted into the genes. A person who goes to Florida might get tan and might have bleached hair, but just because they have that, their children will not have those characteristics. Because env envir environmental influences are not inherited, they are temporary. Only the physical changes that are due to the genes are inherited. Let's look at our second point. We saw how life was established on earth. Let's look at how the law was established on earth. How the law was established on earth. Verses 14 to 31. Whole libraries have been filled with the books relating to man's study of the stars. The Bible is not a handbook of astrology, and it doesn't really claim to be, and it's not really a handbook of any other science. However... Each time the Holy Spirit refers to a subject that can be scientifically investigated and studied, he does so with unerring precision, and I love that. How does Moses know that the sun was bigger than the moon? Have you ever pondered that question? How did Moses know that the sun was bigger than the moon? Ordinary observation would make anyone conclude the very opposite. We've all seen the giant harvest moon in October. Anybody ever seen that? So of hands, where it seems like it's like eight feet in diameter. It's hovering right, it looks like the Death Star almost, right outside our galaxy or our atmosphere. It looks amazing. We've never seen the sun look so big. Ancient people thought the moon was far greater than the sun and accounted for its lack of light and heat as compared with by the sun because assuming it was much farther away from the earth than the sun was. Moses did not make that mistake. He said that the sun was bigger than the moon and we now know, of course, that it's so much bigger that the sun could contain six million of our moons. But Moses could have easily made the opposite mistake and said that God appointed the greatest light to rule the day. Many ancient peoples worshipped the sun as the greatest light or object in the heavens, but what a terrible blunder it would be for the first page of our Bible to declare that the sun is the greatest object in the sky. The star on Teres on the screen, for example, is so large that it could swallow up to 64 million suns the size of ours. 
And in the Algrera constellation, the star Epsilon is so vast that its diameter is 3,000 times the size of our sun and its volume some 27 billion, with a B, times our sun. With what astonishing brevity, too, does God dismiss the creation of the stars in space? Look in verse 16. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And then three words. And the stars. And the stars. What perspective of truth. The Bible takes some 50 chapters to discuss the construction and significance of the tabernacle, yet the tabernacle was only a temporary structure. 50, ta- 50 chapters about the tabernacle, three words about all the stars in the universe. Truly, our Bible looks at things from quite a different perspective than we do. The Bible is a handbook of redemption, that's why, amen? It was nothing for God to create. To create, he only had to speak. But to redeem the human race from the slave market of sin, he had to suffer. That's the perspective of the Bible. Had man written the Bible apart from the controlling inspiration of the Spirit of God, the billions of stars in our galaxy, the the 100 million of other galaxies in known space, the postulation that known space is only one billionth of theoretical space, Sure, James John tells us that there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of the world. And so God dismisses it all as little account and the stars. God is more interested in people than he is in planets. He's more interested in souls than he is in stars. Can I get an amen? Moses begins in verse 20 by showing how man's domains were prepared for him. The seas were filled with fish, and the skies were filled with fowl. Now, fish and fowl have much in common. I don't know if you know that. Well, it's it's been my job this week to study those things, so I just want to share a few interesting things with you. Fish and fowl, well, both have streamlined forms to enable them to move swiftly through their native habitats. Both are covered with shingle-like layers of protective fins or feathers. Both have hollow light bones. Both lay eggs, and both have migratory instincts. Water is the preeminently, the preeminently seat of life. There's not a bay or creek, a shelf or sound on the face of the earth that does not, not teem with life. Even a drop of ditch water can hold 500 million microscopic creatures so small that a teaspoon of water would seem to them like the Atlantic Ocean is to us. Only a God who is infinite could have worked on such a majestic scale as we see in the skies and on such a microscopic scale as we see in the seas. On the sixth day, just prior to the creation of man, God made his final preparation of the earth as man's domain. He created vertebrae and creeping things. Moses gives threefold classifications for this. He refers to cattle, that's four-footed domestic animals. He refers to creeping things, creatures that move on the ground. And he refers to beasts, the wild animals. Now, scientists have classified millions of different species of animals, including more than 800,000 different kinds of insects, 30,000 kinds of fish, 9,000 kinds of birds, 6,000 different kinds of reptiles, 3,000 kinds of amphibians, 5,000 kinds of mammals. God is truly a God of variety, as I can see right now by looking at y'all. Amen? I'm reminded of the children's song, red, yellow, black, and white. We're all made precious in his sight, amen? One can perhaps sympathize with a person who pictures life struggling to emerge on the planet and and at last succeeding as a lonely, isolated form. But where did all the bewildering varieties of life come from? The same God. Picture this, friends. The same God who with fantastic prodigality tossed out into intangible space countless stars and their satellites and who keeps them whirling and plunging on their journeys through space at inconceivable velocities, yet with such mathematic precision that we can tell the occasion of an eclipse or the visit of a comet years in advance. The same God who did all that with equal boundless prodigality selected a single planet and filled it with bewildering numbers of form of life. Almost like God said, hey, there, look at that. Check that out. See what I can do. 
having to describe, starting in verse 26, how man's domains were prepared for him. Moses concludes the narrative section of the creation story by telling how man's domains were presented to him. The section begins by telling how God created Adam. Now, the Holy Spirit does not say that man was created in the image of and likeness of beasts or animals, God said, let us make man in our image. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I will touch on this. I love how in the first chapter of the Bible, we see the Trinity. Let us make man in our image. God's not talking to the angels. Angels can't create. He's talking to the other members of the Trinity. Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image. In his nature, in his person, in his personality, in his moral and spiritual capacities, in his emotions, his intellect, his conscience, and his will, man stands apart from the brute of creation. And thus God created Adam. He, then he crowned Adam. He crowned him in three different ways. He crowned him by first bestowing upon him a posterity. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Through Adam and Eve, the whole human race was to spring. Adam is consistently seen in the Bible as the federal head of the human race. The doctrine of evolution, by striking at the story of Adam and Eve, launches a critical attack upon the word of God at a strategic point. If you cut out Genesis chapter 1 from the Bible, you must also tear out Romans 5. And because God sums up the whole human race in Adam and traces all the sin and sorrow and sadness of this fallen world back to him. If there's no Adam, then the Bible is false. Romans 5 is built on a myth, and we have no salvation. If there is no Adam, Jesus is mistaken, in which he's not then the Son of God. The Bible is based on a myth, and we have no salvation. But God begins with Adam and declares that the human race sprang, sprung, sprung, whatever it is, from him. I believe in the historical Adam, and I hope you do too. There was an Adam first created by God, actually lived, actually existed, and the whole human race came from Adam and Eve. It's important. Secondly, God crowned Adam with position. He gave him dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing, every scientific and technological advance, every feat of engineering, every new scrap of knowledge and nature and function of the universe is an outworking of that dominion God gave Adam and Eve in Genesis 1. And finally, God crowned Adam with a possession. With a possession. He gave him a paradise to enjoy. It's impossible for us to imagine what the world would have been like in the early dawns of time, that first week of creation. Pristine, unspoiled. It sprung from the hand of God. Each day must have been a day full of exciting discoveries for Adam. Can you imagine, as an adult smelling a flower for the first time. Can you imagine that, that, that situation? Can you imagine seeing all these animals as an adult for the first time as you take in God's creation? Imagine seeing an elephant and how amazing that would have been. Imagine, imagine seeing a, a bee fly around or, or a mosquito fly around but doesn't sting you yet because the fall hasn't happened and just be like, wow, that's amazing. Imagine seeing the rivers and, and the trees and the vegetation all perfect because that's how God created it. Adam got to take that in for the first time, the marvelous sounds and smells and sensations. And the narrative ends with a statement that the work of God, the work of creation was very good. And that brings me to my last point, number three. God rested. Chapter two, verses one through three. The opening verse in chapter 2 seems to be a footnote of the story of creation. The rest of God is a wonderful thing. Not, of course, because God's tired, God's worn out, he's exhausted from all of his hard work in the first six days. The more we understand the nature of the physical universe, the more we see that the material universe is merely an expression of the boundless energy of God. Each material object in the universe is composed of atoms, bundles of pure energy, energy passing into motion, motion passing into phenomena. Obviously, the God who can create universes so many that man can't count them, and who can lock up within a tiny breast of an atom enough energy to obliterate an island, that God cannot grow tired. 
the rest of God tells us that the creation was complete. It was finished. And the words rang out at the close of creation as they did on the cross at the close of redemption. There is a great satisfaction at surveying the finished work of someone or something or what you did. And so God stood back as it were to cast an admiring, contented eye or glance over the finished work of his hands. The rest of God tells us moreover that the creator was content. On the seventh day, God, having ended his work, rested. And then he blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it. Thus he instituted the Sabbath ten times in verses 2 and 3 in chapter 2. God is mentioned by name as though to emphasize that this was God's Sabbath. Later on, he extended it to Israel as part of his covenant with that people. But instead, like anything else with which man has to do, the Sabbath was quickly distorted and destroyed. And instead of being a day of rest, the Jews with their genius for religious minutia encrusted the day with such enormous coverings of traditions, the day became an intolerable burden. And so God's Sabbath rest was soon to be broken by sin when the Jews accused Christ of breaking the Sabbath which I now find so interesting after studying this passage. God rested on the seventh day and created a Sabbath, and the Jews accused Jesus of breaking that Sabbath, the person who held the first Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? When they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, he replied, my father is still working, and I also. And that work took Jesus to the cross, where it was finished to the satisfaction of God. And today... We rest not on a special day, but in a person. Ours is not a ritual rest, but a real rest. We rest where God rests in Jesus Christ and His finished work. Amen? We rest in knowing that our God truly holds all things in motion. Our God is sovereign over all things. Our God who knows every detail of the universe, the inner workings of all things, because he made them, cares for you and me. He knows your name. He knows my name. He knows my struggles. He knows my anxieties. He knows my hurt. He knows my pain. He knows my ambitions. He knows every single thing about me. But yet he holds all things in balance. And nothing happens without his knowledge or decree. God knows and loves you. Why? Because you're made in his image. That should be an encouragement. That should be a help. And as the band comes to consider the creative acts of God, friends, pay attention, we're almost done. To consider the acts of God as described in the first chapter of Genesis is to understand something of the omnipotence of the mighty God. From nothing he brought into being the heavens and the earth. From formlessness he brought about his perfect design and form. From emptiness he filled the seas with fish and skies with birds and land with creatures of every description. The psalmist was right in saying the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork whether we try to comprehend the enormity of the whole animal creation or the complexity of one tiny ant, we should respond and worship to God after reading Genesis 1 for his creative wisdom and power. Like the 24 elders in heaven, we can say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Let us wonder in the creative acts of God in the early days of time. Let us bask in the knowledge that this is our God, created all things, knows every detail, things that we can't even fathom, but yet knows who we are. Created it for us. And as we'll see in the coming weeks, it quickly went sideways and had to rescind his son as a redeemer to purchase the human race from the slave market of sin. And that human race includes you, friend. Hope to see you next week as we dive into the rest of chapter two as we see some very interesting details in the Garden of Eden. Thanks for being here. Hope to see you next week. Let me pray and then we'll finish our time with a song. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the privilege to study this passage, to walk through it together with my friends. 
to think about these amazing things, some things we can't even fathom, but Lord, we know you can because you made them. They come from you. Father, help us to bask in your glory and in your wondrous works, things we take for granted every day, but God, you made them and you know them. And you made us and you know us. Father, thank you for times like these. Be with us now as we leave this place. Bless us as we go into this next week, into our schools, into our workplaces, into our families, into our friends, whatever it might be. Give us strength to know your name, to worship you well, and to proclaim the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ. All God's people said.